Wherefore Series 2, Episode 3. The wassail is invariably a charming event, with the winter greys of January cheered by the addition of brightly coloured dancers, mummers and people in beast costumes. The centre of Stroud tinkles with the sound of Morris bells. These are great for warding off fairies. They often have similar effects on jaded singer-songwriters and certain kinds of jazz enthusiasts. Whether the jazz enthusiasts are also fairy folk is a topic we may revisit at a later date. Bank Gardens is usually subdued and extremely non-magical during the wassail. All of the borders closed to keep out the sound of bells. All through the day and into the night there will be Morris dancers walking through it and around it, unwittingly beating the bounds and doing a little pushback against the supernatural for the sake of people who do not enjoy that sort of madness. It is possible there would be more love for Morris dancers and more respect for them if people understood their age-old role in the power struggle between humans and fairies. Often they are all that saves us from kidnap, enchantment, unwholesome seductions and terrible betrayal. This year, the Beast Parade is an especially glorious thing. Five of the Auroch herd can now shift their shapes at will and are in the parade in their giant cow forms. Other members of the herd act as beast minders, guiding and supporting their comrades as they process through the streets. Regular people watching the parade are expecting to see beasts, and so they do indeed see beasts. They see especially amazing costumes and impressive paper mache. They do not think too much about how such amazing outfits have been made. The Aurochs dance. It is a strange, slow movement made of side steps and ponderous forward motion. They have given it a lot of thought. Unlike the masked people in the procession, the Aurochs can see where they are going. They follow close on the heels of the Stroud beast, and around them the masked and dancing creatures try not to bang into each other. Ursula is in the procession wearing her bear skin and being a dancing bear, with the chain from her collar in Neris's hands. They've had a lot of conversations about collars and leads because Ursula wants to be an authentic dancing bear, but collars have other connotations. They decide that so long as they are both clear about it not being a power exchange thing, that the collar is acceptable. There are two other bears in the parade. One is a fabulous piece of kit made from hessian sacks and is the work of the Transition Stroud Textiles Group. The other is actually a bear with a complicated personal history who does not quite know what is going on or why they are there, but who finds Ursula appealing and keeps following her. The mammoth is only in the procession some of the time. This is largely accidental, but the pull of many creatures in motion speaks of migration along the edges of the ice, and it attracts memories, ghosts and ideas. Most of the people watching cannot exactly see the mammoth or the other lost, extinct beings who follow in its wake. Their presence is felt, a heady mix of grief and wonder. There is a ghost horse who comes from the subscription rooms. There is a strange composite horror of an entity referred to by the local wizards as the vermin. It is quite like a ghost in that it is made of things that once lived and now do not. It is unlike a ghost in that the vermin is a creature of many parts that were once separate. It is an old creature grown slowly and in anger during the time when rewards were given for the corpses of vermin. It isn't big enough to be all of the creatures caught and killed for such payments. The vermin is an angry beast. It isn't in the procession for fun and frolics. It is there to snap its many jaws at the people who gather along the pavements. However, being entirely non-corporeal, nothing effective can be done with those many teeth, and very few people even see what is happening. For those who can see, it is a strange vision indeed. The vermin staggers along at the end of the procession. Its body is made of bodies that in no way fit together, nor do they cooperate with each other. And yet it moves as a single entity, and the many snarling faces gnash their teeth and try and bite the onlookers. However, teeth and oblivious audience never connect with each other. No blood is shed, no retribution is available. Mad with frustration, the vermin bites nothing and keeps biting, as though somehow, at some point, this will make a real difference. It never does. And even so, every year the vermin gathers itself together to join the wassail procession. What it or its component parts do the rest of the time is anyone's guess. Usually the vermin is the last thing in the procession. The wizard Whitminster watches it go by and nods with satisfaction. 
it has been a good wassail, despite the weather. The streets are full of people who are cold but in good spirits. They will fill the cafes and pubs and already the energetic flow of money hums in the air. The wizard Whitminster is very keen on flows of money as energy in the local economy and the ways in which those flows can be directed to serve a purpose. A her purpose, most specifically. There is so much that can be made out of all these tiny financial interactions as they build towards something unimaginably bigger. Of course, Whitminster imagines that's the whole point. With the vermin snapping its way up the street, the wizard Whitminster shifts her weight towards one foot and is about to follow when an unexpected sound halts her. It is the noise of an oboe and drum kit fighting to the death for control of a bassoon bass line. She smiles. Pure jazz. And then she shivers as a darkness trailing a deeper darkness speeds its way up the street, taking the jazz music with it. For a moment she thinks it was a bicycle with the stereo on. But then she knows in her bones that it was nothing of the sort. The wizard Whitminster shudders and does not move.